for opportunities. So, um, about Victor, uh, I'm 35 years of age. I am married to Monique, and I've got three beautiful girls, uh, Italia, and Gianna, uh, four years, two years, and uh, three months. So you can imagine uh, the last four years how they've been, especially many of his parents. Um, and also, I'm um, third born out of five, um, born out of born in Zimbabwe. Um, fortunate that my parents are still alive, and all my siblings are still alive. So really grateful for that. So at the core of um, me, there are four core things from my side, right? So uh, I believe that my purpose in life is to do three things, is to build, pioneer, and to bridge. Uh, so a lot of the things that I, I do and have done have been quite aligned to uh, that particular purpose. And I share quite some interesting hobbies. Uh, I love my crickets. Uh, I enjoy architecture. Uh, and also last spending time with my wife. Uh, and we, she, she got me to like movies. So that has become a hobby uh, on my side. And then I've got other interests. Uh, so interests meaning things that excite me or I think about. Um, but I might not have time to be doing right now, which are the built environment, mobility as a whole, as well as uh, the investment space. And then my cash cow is entrepreneurship, um, which is uh, what has led us to, to this talk. Uh, so my cash cow is an, a logistics platform, which is in the tech, which I'll take you through uh, shortly. But before I actually take you through the journey, I just want to show you in terms of where we are, so I can then take you through how we got to where we are. So I'm running a, a small, startup where we are processing about two billion rand a month um, of goods through our platform. Uh, we've got 150 million rand worth of logistics transactions uh, processing through our system. We're processing about 7,000 trips a month um, and we're moving about 200 million kilograms on a monthly basis uh, of cargo. Uh, and the business is, is valued in the nine digits uh, from a rand perspective. Hopefully soon it will be uh, nine digits in, in dollars. Um, and it's funded by uh, both uh, venture capital as well as corporate investors such as Standard Bank, Old Mutual, um, and a few other venture capital <coughs> capitalists. And then um, very interesting for me was in the last sort of four years, the bank created um, in terms of the business itself, I would have had to work 297 years, right? So, which is multiple generations. So I think there's a really strong power in entrepreneurship, which um, I'm going to take you through shortly. And, you know, we service uh, a lot of uh, a few blue chips, uh, and right now we're only servicing uh, these listed and global companies. And I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. But the whole journey actually started in primary school. Right, and my situation was I had very strict parents, um, and we were very, very strict about school. So, and we're not allowed to play sports at all. They thought sports was uh, a bit of a waste of time. Um, but I understand where they're coming from because my father was sort of the first to be educated in his whole in his whole clan. So they thought education was everything. So. Um, I enjoyed my sports in primary school, so I, I, I was sneaking in sports. So to a large extent, I was a very naughty boy, um, but in a in a very good way when you look at it, um, uh, uh, when you look at it now. So that no sports policy um, was also supported by my mom used to garden and sell the fruits in the garden. Right, we used to do cabbages, we used to do carrots, onions, and in the afternoons she would sell them. And sometimes. Up out to, to, to sell the, 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 the stuff. And she also used to crush it. Right? So I saw the crush it in, and uh, in, in, in Shona, it is called the Madoy. You know, and then they would come to South Africa and they would sell them. Yeah. So I started getting exposed to entrepreneurship at a, at a young age. So the spot there was my sporting uh, interest led me to play sports like cricket, athletics, tennis, etc. in primary. However, I was very good at cricket. So I, was, uh, I ended up being sort of the first 
um, person of color to play for Mashonaland West, which is a province in Zimbabwe. But what that did was we go on these interesting tours, right? And you get exposed to so much amazing things. So we used to share, you know, a, a room with, with my brothers, uh, you know, the three of us sharing a, a small room. And then you get to these tours and you have a farm where you've got your own kitchen and you've got a jacuzzi in your room, right? So I remember going back um, and I, I didn't like my parents wondering, why, did you, why do I not have this? Why do I have to go outside the house to brush my teeth, right? So at that point, I was quite dissatisfied. But in that dissatisfaction, um, it's kick-started um, a lot of independent thinking. Then I thought to myself, well, I've been exposed to that, right? Why can I not have that? And that's where the concept uh, of sports as entrepreneurship started. I said to myself, let me focus on um, this cricket. I know it's going to get me far. Um, and I started using it as my first form of entrepreneurship. And I know a lot of parents, um, we, uh, for our kids, we, we struggle to support sports. But um, the lessons learned, even if the kids don't play for provincial or national, whatever it is, um, those lessons that we learn are very vital which I'm actually still using right now in, in my business career. And just using one at your disposal. And then from primary school, the journey moved to high school. So uh, form one, I learned at uh, Jameson High School. Uh, and my dad was uh, able to put together some school fees here and there so that I could go to a decent school. Uh, but in that year, I then uh, made the under, third, under 14 cricket team for, for Zimbabwe. And then I got seven scholarship offers, you know, to go to St. John's, Peter House, I had so many options, and I ended up going to Prince Edward, right? Which was at the time when I was uh, when I went to PE, I was just coming from the school they used to call Wash for Snake, right? <laughs> You're coming from the Snake School, you know. So I didn't fit in at all. Um, because you know, other kids would go with two trunks of, of one with food and one with clothes. My whole bag was my cricket bag. It fits everything I needed, right? So I didn't fit in. Um, and you, you, you wake up earlier to go to the showers because I didn't have radars. And what do you call it, a sponge? You know, I used to have the blue soap uh, on your towel, right? So I didn't fit in at all um, at the beginning. But what I didn't realize was we all have the same resources available to us at school. Um, and we also uh, have the same amount of time um, in a day. So I started playing different sports, you know, to kind of get out of it to, to the point where at the end of it, I represented about five uh, sports for the country. Uh, I was involved in cricket, hockey, uh, both indoor and field. I did athletics and I did cross country as well. So I had enough time to be going to practice and uh, not messing around because I didn't have, I wasn't part of the, 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 the crew and the squad. And I ended up also doing other things uh, in high school. So I think what is quite key in those years was I learned the art of just putting your head to something and just going with it, uh, especially when the odds are against you, right? So um, it's about just rethinking and thinking differently about your environment. And also learned the art of charting your own path, um, where I said to myself, listen, I can follow uh, you know, the rich kids. Uh, or I can decide to say, how do I create my own DNA um, in high school or in primary school, wherever. And some of those lessons I still use up to this day. And then I also learned that failure is inevitable, right? Uh, and I'll show you shortly now um, when I talk about my gap year, uh, which was after high school. So after high school, at the end of it, I received um, an honors award. Uh, which was endorsed by the Queen uh, of, of Britain, and mine was the uh, 29th award in 130 years, right, for all around excellence. And I was fortunate to also, go, to also meet the Queen um, at the time um, because of that, uh, in terms of academic excellence as well as sporting excellence. And then after high school, I went to a gap year, right? So my parents couldn't afford to take me to university. Um, and then I had to try to make a plan, 
Right. So at the time, Zimbabwe started sort of being a bit uh, challenging. That was around mm -hmm. two thousands. So they couldn't even take me to the local. So what I said was, okay, um, that's perfectly fine, but I have a big disadvantage. I I only got five points in A level, uh, and this is a funny one. I got two percent in maths. I know it really. <laughs> When I look at it back at it now, you know it's uh, it's quite amazing how someone can get two percent because you you just get your name right and they give you a box. So it's like, I just got my name right. But during that gap year, reality hit. I had all these accolades in high school, um, and I couldn't go to university. I wanted to go do architecture, and I couldn't couldn't make it happen. And I was this glorified high school kid. Uh, I was in the newspapers and everything else. So, and then I had an offer to to play for Zimbabwe cricket, which was like a five, six year offer. And I started learning that God speaks to us in many different ways. Um, at the time, very strangely, I refused it, right? Because in my head, I thought, listen, if I was to get it, and three years down the line, I'd break my, my ankle and I can't play cricket anymore, I don't have education, so let me go get an education, I can always come back and play. So it was a very unpopular decision that I made at the time. And then, because of that, you know, they disbanded me a little bit, saying I didn't know what I was doing, so I ended up going to coach at Cato Primary. So I had two, two jobs. What I was doing is I was uh, coaching at Cato Primary, and I also went to volunteer. At, a, at an entrepreneur, uh, sorry, at an architectural firm. So I think that volunteering, I mean, came up as a funny story because uh, initially he went in, I wanted to get in, and they wouldn't allow me to see the owner, to say, hey, can I work for free just to learn and understand the entrepreneur, uh, sorry, architecture. They wouldn't let me in. Um, so one day I, I knew his car, so I waited by the traffic lights. His car had this ladder at the back. And so he struck me by 10 minutes from office. So I went, hooked, my, hooked myself at the back of his car. And he went into the office, and the security didn't see me. They only saw me when the car was inside. So, so they, when, when he came in, he's like, security's making promotion, someone to jump onto your car. And he's like, no, why, why, why did you do that? I said, listen, I've been coming here every day for two weeks, and you haven't been allowing me to, they haven't been allowing me to see you because I'm a volunteer to work in an architecture firm so that I can just learn and understand what's happening. And then he said, listen, because of that, you start now, right? You've never seen such uh, sort of assistance that you jump on top of a car just to go get exposure. So I got exposed uh, to a lot, um, learned a lot from an architecture perspective. And initially, I was actually just print, a printing boy, right? I was just writing to printers, seeing buildings, seeing how they work. And then <coughs> they actually started exposing me to architecture software to the point where by the end of about six months, uh, I could design my own buildings. All right, so what I was doing is I would coach at Gateway in the morning, bought a bike, then rode into town, and then rode from town to Gateway, I mean to, to, yeah, to Westgate, uh, which is about 10, 15 k's from uh, where I was. So here we here this glorified high school boy and now he's riding a bike in the rain. So, you know, you become a laughing stock, but at the time, I just thought to myself, listen, it's for the greater good, um, right? And I learned the art of using your time, so I had half a day open, and I said, why don't I go and volunteer a skill, to learn a skill that I want to do? So a lot of us have a lot of time that we also face with the social media, so um, if we could use that time, to actually find a skill that you can learn um, in that available time. It would be amazing at how it prepares you. So yeah, so um, I learned a lot, you know, and then I said to myself, listen, do I specialize in architecture or do I actually want to own the architecture company? Right. So that's when I started saying, well, let me start applying for scholarships to actually go and study business because I designed about 50 houses at a time. <clears throat> in that um, in, the, in the architectural space, so I designed about twenty houses, and then I said, let me just go and learn how to actually run the business. I could buy a bike, bicycle, you could buy a small laptop, 
um, as well because I could, you know, I had using my skills for that. So that's when I learned about just having the vision of saying, okay, this is where I want to go. Uh, let me just try and stick to it. Even though the odds are not, like, I'm not winning right now, uh, why don't I put all my efforts into it and let me just give it the best shot? And then I also learned that God, God's blessings are very random, right? So God will bless you through people you don't like, people who don't even like, you know, to the point where um, God will bless us through people we, uh, people, people we don't like, people doing uh, bad stuff, actually sometimes preparing for us is children, right? Where one moment, because you are prepared, uh, if you're ready for the opportunity, we take it on. So I learned that, especially when I got my cricket scholarship, uh, I got it from really random places. And that's where I went to um, my fifth point, which was the undergraduate, which is where I did my BCom. So I did my BCom um, in finance at the University of the Western Cape uh, on a cricket scholarship. Um, and at that time, my parents had not paid any school fees for me since high school. Right? Obviously, my siblings would support me with uh, uniforms and uh, everything else. Uh, so my parents had not paid any school fees since uh, from high school all the way through to university. Because of that uh, initial thought of saying, how do I use my skill and how do I make sure that whatever I'm good at, I can actually use as entrepreneurship, which was for me sports at the time. So at university I had one goal. And my one goal was not to go back to the sand. So I grew up in uh, Sandy Kadoma in the township, uh, where you know you the moment you get out, sand will be hitting you on your cheek, right? So I said to myself, I don't want to go back. Um, uh, I want a better life, I want to get out of that environment. So that's why um, you would only find me in four, four places. I never gone to Long Street up until I went with my wife after I got married, right? And Long Street was 15 minutes, 20 minutes away from my university. You only found me in four places, which was in class, in the library, at the cricket field, or in my room. If you found me anywhere else, you'd be completely out of character. So uh, that's when I started focusing on making sure that I use the school resources. Because we have the big libraries, we have all these facilities. And I say to myself, how could I use them at the best, to the best of my disposal? So I ended up starting four businesses in university, two commercial and two uh, non, uh, non-profit. And the two commercial, I actually hired four of my own lecturers uh, to develop stuff for me, macros, and uh, we had a one project where we actually did barcodes for all the assignments um, in the whole school. Uh, and, and at the end of it, I ended up receiving Raymond Ackerman's uh, Best Entrepreneurship Award for the country um, through that. And in that same uh, university, at the end of it, after three years, I ended up winning the three out of five uh, sorry, awards uh, the university offers student of the year, entrepreneur of the year, and leader of the year. And in that same year, um, I was very fortunate that I was chosen as one of the 100 brightest young minds, where I actually met my wife. She was also one of the 100 brightest young minds. And then um, the two of us also chosen from the 100, they chose six, uh, three male, three female, who I was called the chosen. Uh, and my wife. I uh, was also part of it, so um, ended up meeting my wife uh, through those entrepreneurial activities uh, because I had a decent profile that allowed, you know, God, God's people to, you know, be, sort of share, open their favors uh, through, through, through recognition. And then, whilst I was doing my third year, I got a master's, I got a, I actually got a place to do master's. I didn't have to go through honors, I didn't have to do anything straight from that day, I got a place to do masters in the, in the States. However, I just got in the Mandela Road Scholarship to go do honors. So um, as the pioneering uh, sort of element in my life, I was the first to ever decline the Mandela Road Scholarship. Um, and it was a whole negative thing about how as a Zimbabwean, I came to South Africa and I got this 
once in a lifetime opportunity um, with the Mandela Rhodes Scholarship, and I was the first to ever decline it. Because I said to myself, if I could um, go straight to masters and skip a couple of years, then why did they recognize me at one of the top universities to go straight to masters without even going through my fourth year of uni? So it was an interesting decision, um, and I've then learned to, 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 to say, you know, the art of really difficult decisions. Many of us are faced with um, very difficult decisions all the time, um, and I learned at a young age to say, actually, you know, try do the unpopular uh, sometimes, because, you know, if we all follow the same path, um, you know, I read this, I think it was a quote by Peter Drucker that says, the world is changed the world is not changed by the reasonable man, it's changed by the unreasonable man. So that stuck with me to say, I can make difficult decisions that are not popular and own them and be fine with it. And then I also learned about art of preparation, right? So a lot of the um, um, things that were happening, a lot of the opportunities that would come uh, to my disposal were based on how well I was prepared. Because, for example, many of us pray for a car, but we don't have a driver's license, right? So it's the same thing, whether you're in business, whether you're, whatever you're doing, where the art of preparation, where you're always preparing for something. Whatever you're doing today, you could be preparing for something 10, 15 years down the line. So I learned a lot, um, even around turning pain points into opportunities, because uh, I was receiving my, my marks late. I ended up creating the barcode system that would cut time by 90% with just scanning your uh, assignment and boom, you have your marks immediately. So my pain points, I started turning them into opportunities uh, at the university uh, level. And then <clears throat> from that university level, I went through to do um, my first master's, which was at Oklahoma State um, in Oklahoma. And I was the first African on the program um, in the true pioneering spirit. And then the school fees were $90,000 at, uh, at the time. And I could only get a scholarship of $30,000. So I had to um, make a plan for the other $60,000. So what I actually did was, it was a two-year program, and then I decided to crush it into one year. Right, which means for the whole year, I only slept three and a half hours, literally, uh, on average. Um, because I say to myself, $90,000, I'll never be able to afford it. So let me push everything and start it now. And then in the masters, it was one of those masters where you had to actually start a business. We didn't do a thesis, we didn't do any papers, we had to do a thesis, um, we actually had to start a business. So. I said to myself, well, I, I know architecture, and then I was in a place, <clears throat> in a state where there were a lot of tornadoes. So a lot of guys would build these massive houses that are not insured. They, they will be insured, but they don't have plans or anything. They just wake up and say, let's build a 20-seater movie house, and they build it without any plan. Or when the tornadoes hit, then they don't have plans for insurance to reimburse or to rebuild. So I went. I was reconstructing all those houses, um, you know, measuring uh, the damage and actually reconstructing them, putting them into, into working drawings. And I ended up making uh, $40,000 um, in the space of like three months from that business. And what I then learned um, quite a lot of is, you know, it's about the laser focus. I could have actually started different businesses, but I uh, didn't know, which meant that I would have just, you know, had time to learn, etc. So I decided, let me use my skills. And let me be focused on that. And I actually got a massive demand that I actually then ended up helping someone else to actually start it when I left the States. And now it's actually employing about 100 people, that same business, right? So I, I, that's when I learned the power of focus, being laser focused, finding an opportunity, and running with it. Because a lot of us, uh, you know, we're all over the place, you know, we're trying to do this, trying to do that. So if you chase too many rabbits, um, if you chase two rabbits at the same time, both of them are going to run away, right? So then the art of focus, the, the, the power of the focus. And then also, uh, you know, sometimes there's tragedies like the tornadoes, 
um, about how do we uh, say to God, God, you see what happened, and how do we turn that tragedy into an opportunity? Um, and that's how the whole architecture of this in the United States um, started. But at the time, I was just starting new things, etc., which was the art of entrepreneurship. Many of us um, miss the science of entrepreneurship. Um, you know, so the art is the hustling, is the connecting of dots. Uh, but that's how many of us end up building uh, businesses that only last with us. That if we move on uh, and, and and go to be with the Lord, um, the business never continue because we don't focus on the on the science of entrepreneurship. Actually, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship is actually more structured than many people think it is. But most of us think it's the hustling component, but there's a lot of structure, a lot of, lot of systems, processes, um, and structures that have to be in place for it to actually succeed. That's why you always hear 99% of all startups fail because of the lack of mastery of the science of, of entrepreneurship. So. By the time um, uh, I, whilst I was doing my master's in, in entrepreneurship, I created a monthly newsletter um, where I, I was sending it to about 10, 15 CEOs, say, hey, this is what I'm doing, this is what's happened. And to the point where by the time I finished the master's, I had six job offers. Um, and that's where I chose to, to, to come to, to Microsoft uh, from those job offers. And what's also funny about the Microsoft job was it needed someone with 10 years of experience, right? But I didn't have any corporate experience. Um, but because of the entrepreneurship profile I had done, and also the diligence of every month, on the last day of each month, I'll send all these broadcasts, infographics to the CEOs. Um, I ended up getting a, a very good job because they saw what, what, what I could produce just from my own mini board meetings to myself, which is also in these new letters, right? So I think um, no matter what you're doing, whether you're in corporate, whether you're in uh, entrepreneurship, um, I think there is value in always assessing yourself regularly, you know? So for example, I have my personal board meetings every month, you know, from day one of the month to the last day of the month, have I grown, right? Uh, where have I grown? I find people who I'm accountable to, like those newsletters, I was accountable to those newsletters, as an example. So, at Microsoft, I was looking after a million rand's portfolio, and at the time I was a 24-year-old. That's why they needed uh, 10 years of experience. And I managed to actually reposition my role, because I started seeing Microsoft as a customer, right? Many of us are still in corporate, why need to do our own thing? But the problem is, um, many of us don't enjoy our jobs, that's the reality. Because our jobs are the cash cow and we need them. But the moment I change my mindset to say, my employer is actually my customer, that payslip is my invoice to the customer. If I get a bonus, it means my customer is satisfied, if they're happy. Uh, if I get an increase, it means they're happy with my service. If they fire me, then my services are not. So you can actually start, even if you're corporate, looking at um, uh, your employer as your, um, your, your, your customer, because not everyone is supposed to be entrepreneurs. Um, that's the true reality of it. Um, some of us are meant to be corporate, some of us are meant to be um, entrepreneurs. But whatever you're doing, see it as delivering a service Delivery, delivering it with excellence, etc. And in that time in Microsoft, I then did a master's in business leadership, um, and I learned quite a number of things um, there about creating tangible value, right? Value is tangible. Um, you know, we need to look at it from a quantitative and both qualitative, quantitative and, and, and qualitative approach to make sure that whatever we're doing, whatever we're servicing, whether we're serving at, at CMM or whether we're serving the church, that we're actually creating tangible value because that value that you create in whatever you're doing, you can always reuse it somewhere else. And I also learned about corporate systems, right? So um, if you're in corporate right now, you are where you're supposed to be according to God, right? 
you are where you're supposed to be, and there's so much value you can learn uh, from corporate systems. So that's why I start every week. I'll try and meet with someone in legal, meet someone that run to someone in finance. Even though, yes, you know, in corporate, you're only dealing with one small thing. Because in entrepreneurship, you need to just have a good understanding of a lot of the small, um, the different just different divisions, the different aspects of the business. So I started exposing myself in corporate, understanding how finance works, how sales works, um, how targets work, etc. To the point where I felt like now I had vast experience across the board. And I also learned about the power of the name, right? So um, in the entrepreneurship world and even in corporate, um, I learned, you know, that whenever I go and, um, uh, you know, uh, Arthur Sam always talks about, you know, see a man, there's a verse um, in, in Proverbs, I think, uh, see a man diligent in his work and he shall sit before kings, right? So what I learned is, if you're diligent in your work, opportunities will always be there. Uh, you know, most of us rush into stuff thinking, um, you know, I'm going to miss out on the opportunity, but the opportunities are always there. If you just focus on being good at what you do, uh, you know, God will open a lot of doors. He gives you access, and because you are prepared in whatever skill and capability that is, um, you know, you end up seeing so many open doors. And so we all, I learned about the part of your name, uh, where you just say, listen, I need to see you, I'm at Microsoft. Meetings happen immediately, right? But because of the brand, you get to start building your own name. You know, people start knowing, hey, if I, Victor, Victor Chai tells you if he has a name, what do people think, right? And people run away immediately, or they actually say, oh, okay, I've got an opportunity to meet, I want to meet. So we need to safeguard the power of our names. So from Microsoft, I got an amazing opportunity to um, uh, work with Uncle Sam at Value Capital Partners uh, for just over a year and got exposed to the pioneering models um, where you, you take an industry and you reshape it, right? Where you actually take an industry and same game, but you play very different. Right, so I learned the art of, of pioneering at a massive scale. And that's when I also started learning, like right now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that my, all my customers are only blue chip customers. So I learned to actually um, see and understand how big business functions, uh, what's important to them, what drives their value, uh, to the point where the service I'm providing now um, is highly, highly dependent on the value I'm creating. So I learned quite a lot of that um, when I was at Value Capital Partners. And I also learned about experience exposure, right? Where you join leaders who are experienced in their art and they're joining it with the science. And, you know, they're creating this new thing, um, which, is, which is quite novel, right? So, so I learned, and I've done it at a small scale, but now I, I saw it in person at a huge, huge scale. So that was quite exciting for me. Um, and then I also started learning myself, right, to say, because um, I'm, I'm, I'm very operational, right? So I started learning myself to say, uh, do I have an investment mindset or do I have an operational mindset, right? And I started learning that, you know, I'm more on the operational mindset side than I am on the investment side. And there's nothing wrong, you know, with understanding yourself to say, here are my weaknesses, here are my strengths. And that value capital experience really helped me to master myself and actually understand um, my strengths and my weaknesses whilst it was exposing me. And I also learned about um, you know, the power of association. Right? There are some brothers um, in this room and um, on the call that if I actually say I, I was with um, you know, brother Simba, people would be like, okay, yeah, no, that's, you know, that's good. If I tell my wife I'm going to meet Brother Simba, you know, it's it's good. If I say I'm going to meet Brother Herman, you know, she's happy. She's like, yeah, go, don't come back. Come back when you when you when when you're done. Whereas if I say to myself I'm going to meet someone else, it's like, Ish, uh, you know, if you ever spend time with the kids, you know, <laughs> so the association is quite important uh, to the point where 
uh, even now, my association with a lot of brothers I saw on the call and a lot of brothers in this room actually help you in opening doors because you're associated with people of quality. Uh, you're associated with people of, of substance. So that was my journey at Value Capital. And from Value Capital, I, um, I raised a little bit of funds, uh, personal funds with friends and family to start a trucking business because I wanted to understand the value chain of trucking and the best of logistics. And the best way to understand the value chain is to get your hands dirty, right? Many of us try to build our businesses from the boardroom. Um, and I think that is the initial recipe for disaster. Um, and I think it's quite important that we build stuff that we understand, that we know. So that's why I bought trucks and I'll drive with the drivers to as far as Zambia in the truck to learn and understand what they experience and what they go through. <laughs> and boy, oh boy, my wife was not happy. Because <laughs> um, here was a guy with two masters and a, and a beacon, and I'd come home smelling of oil. I think the one time I even bumped into a satin, she made a U turn on me. Right? Because <laughs> I was so oily and dirty at Satin City Mall. Um, so my wife was not too happy uh, at the time. Um, and I, I faced a lot of problems. Right? And this was my first true entrepreneurial engagement, right? Where I was really. Um, experiencing running a business um, end to end, uh, and all that, all those masters, etc., could not help me at the time, right? And that's when I learned the power of experiential learning. Um, it's very important that we experience the problems, because once we experience those problems, then we can create solutions. Because some of us, we we talk about solutions at the bar. Right? Ah, oh, you know, I'm seeing this opportunity, but you haven't experienced it. Um, and it's very difficult to now st structure a solution um, for, your, for you and other people that you haven't experienced yourself. So I would always recommend if you've got a business idea, try it on yourself. Um, you don't need funding at the beginning. Go do it, right? Uh, start it in, on, on paper, try it out, test it with your friends. Make sure it works. And then also learn that this journey uh, is not for everyone. The mental health capacity required is, is quite serious. You know, it's, one, it's that journey where more things go wrong than they go right, um, especially at the beginning, right? There's a lot of mental health issues um, where you're just frustrated, you are angry, um, you know, you're thinking, let me go back to corporate. Um, etc. And through the journey, um, you lose a lot of things, right? You lose a lot of friends, um, you lose a lot of, because you don't have time. You just literally just don't have the time because you're the accountant, you're the salesperson, you're the ops person, you're everything at the beginning. And I also learned that, you know, for some of the businesses, depending on what business you choose, you have to be, you have to capitalize yourself well, right? For example, the logistics business, I had the best customers I could ever ask for, <clears throat> but you run out of cash, right? And that's when I started learning the real realities of cash. Um, that whatever you're doing, especially in the entrepreneurial world, you have to focus on the cash and making sure you're well capitalized. And, you know, a lot of things failed, but most of us look at failure as this one, one big thing. Failure is a series of things, right? You fail in some, you succeed in some. Um, and it's okay to fail as long as we take those learnings and using them to, 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 to move on. And I also learned about personal finance, right? Because yeah, I was, I had started this thing and um, having started this thing, I, uh, I, you know, you buy your houses, you buy cars uh, based on your corporates, because you know, every 25th of the month, Money's coming even on the 24th if the 25th is a Sunday, right? <laughs> so you get your money early and you know it's guaranteed. And then you make these huge investments uh, or decisions uh, from, uh, from a personal finance perspective. But now, when you start, you're earning 10% of what you're earning in corporate, and your savings deplete very quickly, right? So if I had done it differently, I would have. Uh, Pay off my, let's say you pay off an apartment, you pay off your car, 
so that you know your basics. You need to understand what your basics are, which is roof over your head, ability to move around, food on the table, and clothing, and the air you breathe, right? Everything else is, especially when you start in this journey, you have to understand that everything else um, you know, is mainly a want. You need to focus on the needs, make sure that your personal finance, personal finance position is, is good. I know some of us are forced into it because we lose our jobs, get the trains, things happen, um, etc. But I learned that uh, the hard way, you know, where you, I can't, you, I mean, my wife had never seen a legal letter, right? A letter of demand, right? But I, 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 through the journey, I received those things. Um, you know, as a man, sometimes it was very difficult because, uh, you know, for months and months, it was my wife paying the bills, right? Because there was nothing coming. And I couldn't pay myself. I couldn't do a lot of things um, in, this, in, in that business. But I learned the art of you know, keep fighting, especially uh, you know, know when to give up, right? Know when to give up and when to keep going. Because I understood that you know, that logistics business that I was running, I was learning getting a lot of different things to the point where I created 60 or 62 different Excel sheets just to run my own operation. And then I said during the time, well, why don't I test them with other trucking companies, right? And they started testing them and they also saw their operations improve. And that's what led to um, uh, Triplo, which is the current venture that is um, my passion, it's my cash cow um, at the moment, and that's what I'm fully focused on um, as we speak. So Triplo, um, we're a logistics software company. Uh, we're based here in Joburg, um, but uh, we've got teams in Cape Town, teams in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, um, and we've got, uh, we're starting, I mean, we've been used in about 14 countries um, as we speak, and we own 100% of our own intellectual property. So basically, we're building our own software that we own fully, and we, we're building it as a product, not as a service. Um, not software development as a service, where I bill you per hour to develop stuff. We're going into the market, understanding logistics needs, and crafting solutions that you just license out to as many people as you want, um, so that we can scale uh, properly. Uh, in 2021, we named South Africa's most innovative company, and like I mentioned, we are well-funded by um, some of the blue chips like uh, Standard Bank and Old Mutual. So we're basically using technology, fintech, and logistics together, right? Uh, and we've got proper global ambitions at the point where I think by the end of the year, we'll probably be in about uh, physical presence in about six to seven countries. But my vision for the business is we want to be the best logistics platform globally. Um, and uh, we're starting to see the fruit of it. Uh, for example, in um, uh, Swaziland, we're contributing about 8% of their GDP because of the platform, right? So we're starting to see the small the vision being realized uh, because you know everyone shuns away from African logistics. They think it's um, uh, very behind, um, etc. So I, I really look forward to the day where African logistics is the best logistics globally. So we pro we do three core things and two non-core. Um, so the first thing that we're doing for a lot of the blue chips is we're giving them a wide labeled transport management system. So right now, um, if you, a lot of the uh, products that you're consuming in retail, um, you know, we actually, it's actually being processed a, a bit through our platform. Um, so for example, if you're buying Woolworths branded stuff, everything is actually flowing uh, through our system. Um, if you drink Pepsi, uh, a lot of those Pepsi drinks are also flowing through our system. If you um, drive a Toyota, all the parts that go into production is also, it's also flowing through our system, um, as an example. So they're taking our system, and then they automate automates the end-to-end -end journey from an order up until delivery of cargo, including tracking, including document processing. So we built a mini ERP, uh, which can be deployed in a day. Right. So that's how we've actually been able to displace um, Sorry, if any of the brothers work at, uh, 
SAP, but we've displaced, displaced <laughs> SAP in about three, four different blue chips um, now as we speak. And then the second thing <clears throat> that we do is we've got an Uber type uh, platform for technology where we connect and run the supply. Um, and that way we've got about a thousand trucking companies registered on our system. So if someone wants to move uh, bulk cargo, um, we just go on our system and uh, they can actually, uh, it's the same thing you do on an Uber. You go on Uber, you order a truck um, on our system. And then um, we just started something quite exciting, which is a FinTech product, um, where because of my own cash flow issues in the logistics business, uh, having experienced them firsthand, uh, we've managed to, to secure a massive, <clears throat> massive facility um, to buy diesel upfront for trucking companies and to pay them on delivery. Because you know, a two truck operator can never do business with a, with a blue chip because they only get paid 60 days later, right? And now we're starting to even democratize um, our logistics because now these big blue chips are not able to do business with small trucking companies, which is a big thing from an impact perspective. I mean, it's so, um, it's so quite interesting to the point where even now our vehicles are being targeted, the small trucking company vehicles, right? Uh, because of the mafia type of play, uh, they're not happy that you know these small guys are disrupting. Um, they're disrupting the market, you know, which is our model. Uh, so we're seeing quite some interesting, scary things, uh, threats, and all these things. That's why part of why we're expanding outside of South Africa as well. So we've got a fintech product. Um, I won't go through too much into what the platform does. I'm happy to uh, to discuss it, but we've. We service quite uh, a lot of different blue chips um, in South Africa and um, in other countries. We've delivered cargo to and from really strategic places across the board. So one of the important things that I've learned in the whole entrepreneurial journey is to let go of your ego um, <clears throat> and uh, be, be adaptive, right? Because I'll give you an example. With this trip of business, my vision, um, I mean, our business from when we started to where it is is very different, right? So phase we we actually on phase four in the last sort of four years as we speak. Phase one was building a fleet management tool for me as a trucking company, and then we moved to phase. Then um, we released the platform. I think February 2020. Four weeks later, we had about 50 customers, which was working, right? But Lockdown was announced, and a lot of trucking companies started saying, Hey, I can't be profitable if my trucks are not moving. So we had to quickly pivot, right? Yeah, and at the time, I also learned that, especially with this, you can't be emotional about it. I was emotionally attached to the business at the time. And I think um, uh, one of the brothers, uh, my brother Bogani, was, was my first board member, actually helped me rethink whole thing to say, hey, don't be too hung up um, on this. Why don't you pivot? Um, and then, so that's when I started learning that ad adapting and pivoting, because we're so stuck on the solution, but we can all create solutions that no one buys, right? Mm. Um, so I think very importantly, no matter what business you do, like uh, my brother Siva says, you know, even in, 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 selling, in, in selling beans, um, you know, you need to move off the solution. Right, you need to actually move away from the solution um, and <coughs> track the need and just solve the need. So uh, phase two was we had to pivot, we had to now start giving pe people access to market um, in phase two, and then uh, quickly learned that we were dealing with brokers in middlemen. We never got paid. Um, <clears throat> by the time <clears throat> trips came to us, They've already taken off a big chunk of the money. So we quickly uh, changed the tactics into let's go to cargo owners directly. And then the cargo owners themselves were saying to us, listen, your model works, but I only need it for 5% of the time. Because the other 95% are already contracted to these listed companies. However, I'm running my operations inefficiently. And that's where we 
pivoted our model into the software as a service, where we give them a tool to manage all their suppliers, uh, basically an extension of their ERP. Um, and we've seen amazing results. For example, um, some of the blue chips we're servicing are saving about 60% of their week, right? Which means they're basically saving 60% of the cost. And one company had about 24 controllers, now they only have three controllers. However, they can move, <clears throat> they can move some of those resources to other areas of the business, that's like sales, like, um, so we're basically driving better efficiencies there. And then as we started collecting data um, in these blue chips, we started realizing that um, they don't deal with the small guys. Why they don't deal with the small guys is exactly that cash flow situation I mentioned, that small guys cannot, um, cannot service these big blue chips. And that's where we adapted our model to where we are now, where we're saying, uh, we will give you the software as a service, um, and you can run all your suppliers, but you can now deal with the one truck operator. And that's exactly what we've done in Swaziland with one of the, the blue chips, where they're only dealing with listed companies because they can provide them scale. Right? One company can give them 100 trucks. Whereas now, because of our system, we can now get 50 trucks from 50 transporters, and the blue chip doesn't even know they're dealing with a one truck operator because the system is standardizing the whole experience. It's managing the risk, etc. So that's when we, we started now. I mean, we've got access to about um, uh, quite, quite a substantial amount of money um, to actually do the FinTech component, which is actually our lead into other African countries. Other African countries are saying to us, listen, we're, our markets are so small um, that your licensing fee, yeah, it's cool, but actually I need, I need the financing piece, right? So we've had to learn to adapt um, our model, and the model actually has to adapt to a geography, because Cape Town is different from Joburg. Joburg is very different from Pretoria, right? So how you service your customers in the different um, geographic elements is completely important. So we started realizing that, um, hence what started bringing the international uh, component uh, to the point where um, uh, now we actually, uh, our main lead into Africa is our FinTech product, whereas more developed markets is our software as a service product. Um, so we need to learn to just listen to customers, let go of our ego, um, and understand what their real pain points are. Because um, I think what's won us a lot of these blue chips was, you know, a lot of the uh, big companies come to you and say to you, use my system, you need to change your processes around, uh, you need to change your processes for you to use my system. Whereas what we've done is built a menu of items, like go into a restaurant and you choose what you want. So our system, the customer can actually pick based on their specific needs uh, from that perspective. So all this is how we come to this position where we're processing um, uh, the amount of transactions that we're processing. And this is why you know, we cited the standard banks and all the mutuals as investors because of the um, potential that the business has across the board. So I'm just going to close with a few key learnings. Um, and I've spoken through a lot of them across the board. Uh, like I mentioned before, this journey is not for everyone. Um, because if it was for everyone, all businesses would not be operating properly, right? Um, you know, you find you know, these big butchers with 10,000 10, employees, but it was only started by a few people. So the journey is not for everyone. It's okay for, you, for people to stay in corporate. Um, secondly, uh, number two uh, is understand what's enough for you. So I've always dreamed to become a billionaire, you know, and ambitious visions and dreams. Um, but when I started this journey, it humbled me at the point where, yes, if God, did, if God blesses me, I'm happy, right? However, I know what's enough for me. I know what's enough for my family. So I, 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 I was frustrated at the beginning, whereas now I'm in a much happier space because I kind of know what's enough for me, um, and I know that I'm no longer making 
uh, drastic decisions because I want to become a billionaire. I'm not making decisions because you understand yourself, you understand your position. Then number three is, like I mentioned before, make sure your basics are covered. Um, I do not stress this one enough. You, you know, the moment you leave your house, you're at war already in the marketplace. Um, you know, you don't want to come to a house where your wife is not sleeping because you've got legal letters, right? Um, so just make sure your basics are covered before you embark um, on this particular journey. And then understand your capabilities and, and uh, yourself and your capabilities. Um, that's, this is how we end up, um, you know, if, if one brother is in doing cryptocurrency, I now think, you know what, I'm going to go do cryptocurrency. Right, and that's the first um, sort of brief step of failure in our business is that we end up doing businesses outside our capabilities and our competence, um, and we can't run it. Uh, we can't run it, um, and and it speaks to the concept of picking your your fights well, right? Pick your fights well, um, choose your lane, um, and you just stick to it, uh, regardless of what's happening. Because a lot of us, sadly, we follow the buzz, right? Right now, there's an AI buzz on the getting to AI, right? Uh, previously, people were thinking there was a whole cryptocurrency buzz. People, a lot of people, was, I mean, lost a lot of money because we're not picking our fights very well. So, as you embark on this entrepreneurship journey, pick your fights well. Uh, I mentioned not follow the buzz. Um, and then, like I mentioned, please experience it first. Um, you have to experience something uh, first in order for you to, to make sure that uh, you're doing the right thing. And then master both the art and the science. Because if you master the art, uh, you, you start something, and within those three years, you have the statistics say your business will fail. If you master only the science, um, you start running a corporatized business, which will not go beyond two years before. Right. So I think it's a combination of mixing the two together. And then there's, there's no rush, to be honest. A lot of us are thinking, I'm going to miss the opportunities. There will always be opportunities available. Um, and I learned this the hard way as well, where you chase after opportunities, you burn money quickly because you try to capture an opportunity um, because you think you're going to lose it. Um, most times than not, the opportunities will always be there. Sometimes maybe in a slightly different form um, than another time, but the opportunities will always be there. And then um, choose the type of entity you want properly. Uh, so you, you need to decide whether am I running a subsistence business, am I running a mom and pop, or I want to actually build an investable, scalable business. And the type of business you choose is actually, I mean, it determines quite a lot of different things. Um, because a lot of us, our businesses don't live beyond ourselves. If something happens to me today, then that's the end of the business, right? Um, and, and, and that's it. So the type of business you choose is, is quite important. And then, like I mentioned before, chase one rabbit at a time, um, humble yourself. Um, and one thing that I didn't know at the time is the power of the family unit. Um, the part of the family unit that you've got this journey is probably the most important thing. Um, the family unit, obviously, is giving God. Um, God at the center of it, uh, your wife, um, being part of it, as well as you know, your extended family. Um, you're not that awesome. That's why you have learned. You know, this journey, no matter how great you think you are, uh, you're not that awesome. Um, it's actually the Lord who gives us um, uh, who, who, who gives us the steps. It's the Lord who opens the doors. Um, uh, it's the Lord who actually um, gives us the opportunities. We just need to be prepared and ready for it. And be, be comfortable losing and firing friends. Because um, I learned um, that you know uh, sometimes when I started the journey, and a lot of the friends I had were doing well in corporate, etc. They will not understand when I say to them, guys, I'm running out of cash. I don't know how to pay my staff. You know, I'm looking for this and that. So I think it's important to find a good confidant uh, through this journey. I've been 
quite lucky because I've had a lot of mentors, uh, Sam, Brother Simba, um, and a few brothers who are online, who I can actually just call and or meet and talk to and experience something different. And also the power of this mentorship and, and coaching. Um, you know, I've learned that you just need multiple people. Um, people have different skills and different experiences. You can pick it back off of, off of them, especially in a setting like ours. Let's build investable businesses. Let's structure for future generations. And know many of us, when we start this journey, we don't separate personal finance to um, business finance. <coughs> and, uh, you know, there will never be any, it will never be investable because the government is not there. How I've been able to uh, sort of attract a lot of this investment was structure your startup as if it was a big corporate. Think small uh, and nimble, um, but act big. Right, so that's how I've been able to, um, you know, put the right systems, processes, and structures in place. And then it's bigger than you hire a team. Um, so, for example, I've I've led to I've actually hired a team that I pay much more than I pay myself. Um, and these are experts, uh, the experience in what they do. I've given them shares in the business because many of us are so hung up on the shares um, that we we then battle to grow the business, because this thing, these things get bigger than us. We need to know when it's starting to tip over, bigger than us, and let go, right? Um, because we get uh, quite uh, stuck in it. Um, just a couple more points as, as we close. Um, and pay yourself. Uh, that's one thing I've learned. Uh, pay yourself, but um, be, be, be wise about it. Uh, don't go pay yourself outside of the market. Pay yourself the market value. So that if anyone is coming into your business, they'll be like, ah, if I invest in this business, um, I won't, you know, this guy's not gonna run away and, uh, with my money. Um, and then, yeah, get your, get your hands dirty. And just the last couple of points, uh, you need to spend money to earn money um, in this journey. Uh, many of us, um, we struggle to build systems, processes, and structures because we don't want to spend the money. Um, so feel free to spend the money because uh, that way like, the business can grow without you. Uh, create a size that this thing can run without you. Um, because sometimes the ego that I want to be the boss, I want to be the decision maker. Um, let other people run with their, with their stuff and make their own decisions. And do it the right way, ethics um, and morals, quite key and using the bible as your your standard operating procedure because everything you need to run a business is actually in the bible uh, that's the reality of it um, so do it the right way um, build your core competences and capabilities and always remember that a billion is a combination of ones you always miss the power of ones because you want the big thing and then we struggle to um you know actually celebrate the small ones um, because you want the, the millions, you want this, you want that. So the part of the one is quite, is quite critical. And lastly, dedicate it to God. Um, let God lead your steps. Let God guide you. Uh, pray for your business the uh, same way you pray for yourself. Um, and that's, uh, that's me. So I hope I'm inspired. <laughs> We hope to hear. I know the story will be a couple of years back. So we hope to hear about the new stuff that's going on. 
a couple weeks' time. Ready to match? Questions? What? Thanks so much for amazing story. Thank you. It's really amazing. Uh, I, I know you the business quite a bit for my work, but I didn't know that this uh, detail didn't say. One question. You you said that well, the site is the active site is required to be right? And I want to take it from the from my end as a practitioner. We um we are brought into the site, right? So we are trained in school or in professional things and like that. So you really become a you taught the science. It's not really the end of technology, but it's running problems that we need to learn. How did we combine it with the art piece? So the, the component of you work uh, putting more overalls, driving to Zambia, but food you still want to do something professional, but there's also some guys who go out of the process. And they really live in community and they go on and they still build something that's more open for the art. How did you manage to ensure that you keep on jumping between the two and go with this strategy around that? No, thanks. Very good question. Um, so I think um, it, 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 it was more initially quality, uh, a qualitative thing where I think I got exposed. Exposure was, was probably the biggest factor to it. You know, where I got exposed to you know, companies like Value Capital, I got exposed to Microsoft. Um, and I could also, I got exposed firsthand to people who were doing fairly well in business and understanding that, you know, the business actually running without them around. Why is it running without them around? Uh, was because of the science component, um, is, for example, right? And I think for me, uh, that was quite important. That's number one. Number two, um, it was, you know, uh, your art gets you to a certain point, but this thing, the art frustrates you when you can't move, when you can't execute, because it's actually the science that helps you with the execution. When you actually start executing properly, the science creates itself, right? Because um, my science in my business will be very different from your science in your type of, in, in let's say in your business. So. Um, so those are the two sort of um, core things that happened to me, mainly ex the exposure. Um, like we'll be very fortunate that we're exposed to such a group where you can get exposed to so many different things. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was great. Um, insightful for people like myself who are going to the same I could relate to the level of stuff. But uh, over the years I've learned that I, I, prob I probably learned better through your through getting to know the biggest challenges and how we manage to do that. Uh, so I wish you can help with those. I'm uh, not so sure the challenges we have met through this young and how we manage to deal with them. Yeah. So I think the, the, I mean, the, there's a lot. We can actually have another session just on the challenges. <laughs> but I think the one key thing has been across anything I've done has been um, the team, right? So, you know, our business is functioning because of people. Um, and for me, that's been the biggest struggle to the point where the team you have today is not the right team for you a year from now. Um, so you have to learn to navigate that. Uh, quite well, um, because you know I've, I've had serious amounts of churn. Even right now, I am still experiencing high turnover. But the good thing about it is, generally, you end up finding the right person um, for the particular job. Because you know, we're one of those environments where you can't hide underperformance. Like it will be seen on a daily basis, right? So whereas in corporate, you could hide behind big teams and stuff like that so yeah so so the team component was quite key um to the point that's why i've learned now to incentivize the team um to make sure i surround myself with a team that's way better and smarter than i am uh, and actually give them the power uh, to be able to do something. And 
one of the things we don't do for our teams is give them shares. So I've given, and, and it, was an, it was amazing because I had a lot of issues before shares, but after the shares, because now people have ownership. So they're making decisions that the best interest of the company, because they're also a piece of it. Whereas you find most of us are part of a company or an employee. So you make decisions that suit your own back account and your own uh, perspective. So yeah, we can dive a lot as well into the team component, but right, hiring the right people is quite critical. Before we go back to, to, to the crowd, let me just uh, let me just come in here. So what an amazing uh, presentation. I think you know when we asked you as a as a as a ministry, we we're quite expecting of what we we're going to receive, but this year's far exceeded what we thought uh, you you were going to share. And some of the the milestones, I think you underplayed, you know, to represent your country five times. Uh, some of the greatest leaders in this world have been road scholars. So, you know, Bill Clinton, all people like that. So for you to turn down a scholarship like that, I mean, it's just amazing. And then you go to Oklahoma, you achieve all these amazing accolades and you still remain, you know, the humble person that you are. I think this has probably been one of the most insightful sessions that we've had as a, as a, uh, as a ministry. So, so I've got a, quite a few questions that I want to ask you, but, you know, forgive me for this, but I have to go back to the 2% in maths. <laughs> <laughs> we just tell us, how did that happen? How, how did you end up with 2% in maths? <laughs> yeah. So um, what actually happened was I was away from school half the time. Because um, at the time I was also playing um, uh, now it's part of the whole men's cricket, uh, men's cricket thing. Um, and I would go to Afro Asia Cups, I'll go to World Cups and stuff. So most of the times I didn't have time to actually, I was not in class. Uh, I think I missed a whole term because I was on tours, I was in Bangladesh, I was in the UK. Um, so sports was taking center stage. And then um, one thing I learned about myself at that time was, you know, I, I was struggling because because I'm operational and practical, I was struggling to understand how um, X, Y plus two minus one, uh, you know, how do I apply it um, in life? So, so that was a big challenge for me, which I actually ended up, I, I was very intentional about it in university to say, okay, whatever I'm now learning, let me go and apply it. And that's why I was able to um, then start all these small ventures at university because now I learned it because of that 2%. It was so embarrassing that when, when um, my older sister, who I was staying with in Harare at the time, looked at it, um, she thought it was a mistake. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she even asked, was the T Pex? So, yeah, that's what happened. No, that's great. I think one of the things that we are going to do uh, because we know you are going to be a billionaire without a doubt. So on that day when you become a billionaire, we'll come with a friend to the same. <laughs> you said something that was quite profound, which was not everyone is an entrepreneur, right? Uh, and it's okay to be in the corporate world and you do very well. A lot of our, of our men out there and ladies who are listening, and Adriel here who is listening as well, um, will be thinking, you know, should I be in my job? Should I go and start entrepreneurship? How, how, how does a person get to know whether they are meant to be an entrepreneur or not? Yeah, so um, one thing I, 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 I'd, I'd miss talking about was uh, most of us think entrepreneurship uh, is, is business. Entrepreneurship is a lifestyle, right? Um, you can actually be entrepreneurial at home um, with the kids. Uh, you know, the, they will tell you, oh, well, dad, we bought. And then at that time, you can actually be quite entrepreneurial, um, uh, meaning you, know, you can innovate, you can create around how things work, uh, move stuff around, do this and that. So many of us, um, if, if it's not a lifestyle, it's difficult for you to understand when the right time is, right? Because 
if it's a lifestyle, um, when the right time is, uh, obviously it's a factor of prayer, but it's also a factor of reality, right? Because I, I, if I had done it differently, I would have maybe stayed in corporate another year, yeah. right? Saved up sustainably um, so that I know I've got 12 months of expenses because initially I started building my businesses for sustenance. And I'll only make decisions so that I can get something to take home. Um, whereas if I, because I had, you know, financial obligations, whereas if I had, didn't have those financial, hectic financial obligations, I would have actually um, probably been in much further than I am now. So I'd have made quicker decisions to grow the businesses, etc. So I think the timing um, is a factor of the prayers, the fasting, um, but at the same time, um, there's a bit of a science to it where you have to look at it and say, um, I was saying to the, uh, what I was saying earlier, that there will always be opportunities. Many of us rush into it thinking, I'm going to miss out. Let me resign from my job because there's a whole crypto happening. Let me start a crypto. Next thing, uh, you're, you're reviewing your CV again. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so that's how I would, I would, I would think it would work. No, that's great. I think I think one of the key takeaways that I got as we were going through the the presentation was how your lifestyle was entrepreneurship. So whether you were at Nelson Mandela University, go to Oklahoma, everywhere you started businesses, you know, three, four businesses, three, four different things. So I think, you know, part of it is not trying to be what you are not, yeah. right? Where you see, oh, Victor has succeeded in entrepreneur, I should be an entrepreneur. And and sometimes that has you know, a lot of uh, pain. Before I go to the audience, I'm going to take one question from, from the audience and one, one online. I wanted to ask you another key question. Um, I think you kept going uh, going to this core thing, which is you need to learn processes. You need to learn processes, right? So we see a lot of uh, people who are entrepreneurs. They go into business. They have some success, but they fail because they don't have processes, right? Or if they don't fail, the business is not scalable enough to succeed when they when they are not in the business. And here you are, 35, 36 year old, you've got a business that's valued in the billions in terms of you know valuation from your investors. What are those key things that someone who's an entrepreneur needs to do uh, to make sure that their business have got the right structure and processes? <clears throat> That's a good point. Um, so, so one thing I've learned is that you can't manage what you haven't experienced and you can't lead what you haven't managed. So um, from the beginning, um, I started exposing myself because I was the only one. I got exposed to everything about the business. You know, you learn about finance, you learn about legal, you learn about sales and marketing um, because those are the core of any business. <coughs> But what most of us do is we shy away from what we're not comfortable with, right? I'm, I'm not a finance guy, so uh, I'm not going to learn about how to read an income statement or analyze it. And that's where the challenges start, where you then now hire uh, a finance manager and, you know, you look two years down the line, they've been siphoning funds out and all those type of things. So, so the first thing is, how do I expose, how do you expose yourself to every element of your company understand it well enough to be able to make decisions i'm not the expert like now i'm not the expert in anything in my business i'm never coded but i understand technology language um and i understand the process uh, so what i've then done is when you hire people who are uh, much smarter who are experts in their field and it's been painful because you're spending so much on these experts but it works because you learn the process of how finance runs, how every every part of the, the, the business runs. One of the key things that I'd learned was to let go. I was so uh, hands on, I was too hands on um, to the point where, you know, if someone is doing something different than I would, um, then it's a problem. I can't even travel because I'm afraid if I travel, the house will burn. Um, that way I can't even scale the business because that's why I was, I was a bit stuck for about a year uh, and a half in this phase of no growth. 
um, because I didn't have the systems, structures, and processes um, in place. And now the business is scaling uh, without me. You know, I can something can happen to me, and the business can continue running because of those systems, processes, and structures. Fantastic. Just just one more uh, um, question on that. So 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 great. Through the years, you learned. Let me learn a little bit of finance, human resources, legal. I'm a guy who didn't learn that stuff, and I've got a business that's operating today. Uh, how do I make sure that I start having the right processes and structure? That's a, it's a perfect question. <laughs> <laughs> so what I've done, um, for example, I've got one dashboard that tells me, that can tell me anything about the business. Um, I think it's about understanding where you are now, because if you are that advanced, uh, there are certain metrics that you care about uh, that you know uh, propel your business going forward. Then it's about because there's a, there's a power. Start with the data, right? Start understanding the data and what the data is saying from an analytics perspective. Because data doesn't lie, right? We can be emotional about our business or be uh, subjective about it because it's our baby. But if the data is saying something, um, then you need to understand. For example, if you've never <clears throat> really done anything legal. I like understood stuff, legal stuff about your business. Just go back. Um, you don't even need to read every legal agreement. Just go back and understand um, the ecosystem, the legal ecosystem. What legal agreements have, have we done in the last four years? Why are they important? Um, and then from there, you can actually build, you can start templatizing things where you say, okay, uh, we've done a commercial agreement. Uh, okay, this, this is the reason why. Um, and then you start asking the right people the right questions. What does this mean? Um, is this still valid? Why is it still important, etc.? Like, for example, because I've done so much fundraising, I actually feel like I've got an honorary law degree, right? Because I've had to read every single word in a legal agreement. And you learn from these lawyers. Because most of us would sit in the room as CEOs or owners of the business, and you sit in, uh, let the experts do what they they need, I'm not, I don't need to listen. Let me be on, on Twitter and WhatsApp. Listen, you will actually learn from the cleaner. You will learn from uh, a driver. You will learn from every person you, you can learn from. And that can help you build those um, uh, systems properly. Awesome. The other, thing, the other thing that I didn't mention uh, for, 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 for the people who are listening is what an incredible young man this is. Because during the week, you know, he, he, uh, he had his uncle pass away during the week. Uh, he was in Rwanda, yeah. where he was doing business there. Uh, so he had all those things to work on, but still prepare for this. And his flight uh, to today landed in South Africa at four in the morning. Wow. And, and he was here to make this presentation. <laughs> So, so a lot of these things that then happens are not by accident. You know, you can just see the consistency in the theme of what an incredible young man this is. So I think we're going to go to Brother Wallace first, and Brother Simba had a question, and then we'll go to online. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Brother Victor, for you know, a powerful story. Um, a, a quick one. Um, you mentioned something about, you know, your business being affected by mafia here in South Africa. Now, I just wanted to hear, you know, a bit more, you know, in terms of how you think, you know, a business should be able to, you know, manage, you know, those kind of disruptions. You know, the do's, the don'ts, maybe from, you know, what you learned. Thank you. Yes. Well, thanks. Yeah, so um, one of the things, for example, that had been happening was uh, we got business from a big blue chip and we were the smallest ever company to get that business. And what we started doing is we started off with about 2% of the business and then we started getting 20% of the business. So a lot of people were not happy. <clears throat> so we started uh, cutting trucks, jacking the trucks, uh, burning the trucks um, as an example for the partners that we had facilitated to deal with the big futures. When that happened, um, I think we there's not much we can do from our side, but there's a real powerful thing about insurance, right? 
Um, so, for example, we ended up, um, we've got multiple sets of insurance. We've got goods in transit insurance, we've got uh, public liability insurance, we've got even insurance related to revenue, right? So, we, we control it from that perspective, number one. And then number two is um, many businesses don't have a full-blown standard operating procedure, right? So when a lot of the thing, events started happening, um, the customer came to us and said, listen, we see you've been affected quite badly. Um, can you give us reports? And within a day, we're able to give anyone a full report of what is happening because we've got our own systems, processes, and procedures. Because, you know, I've learned to control what you can and what you can't. Um, we just work within, within the bounds. So that's how we've been able to navigate uh, that. Uh, it's a, it's still a big issue now, where you know we're displacing. Uh, it is competition, normal competition, but people are expecting it not to come um, from the angles that we're coming in at. So um, there's been a lot of uh, unhappiness in the market uh, from that perspective. So we we can't control it, unfortunately. What we can control is ensuring our business making sure we stick to our standard operating procedures so that we can answer to anything that happens. Great. Brother Simba? Yeah. Is there something you say that was uh, very powerful for me was um, uh, be prepared to fire friends. I, <laughs> I went really a bit, uh, but uh, would you then say that you have to be very circumspect hiring friends in the first place, or because um, it must be traumatic firing your friends, <laughs> or I just wanted you to um, maybe just elaborate more on that. Yeah. Uh, no, so um, the one very important lesson I've learned, uh, one, I mean, it's a key, key lesson was the power of saying no, right? So the power of saying no, and when I, was, when I used to be with my friends, I would say yes, ah, let's go out, yes, we go out. Uh, let's do this, yes, I'll do it. But 90% of the time, I can't come to that braai, you know? Um, so I have to say no, sorry, I can't come, I've got this commitment, etc. So you find that a lot of the friends started drifting apart um, uh, as, as a start, where they're still expecting the victor from 2016 and we're in 2020. Um, you know, that's number one. And then secondly, um, you know, how we choose our friends is very important because uh, the substance around the friendships, especially when you're on this journey, it's a painful journey right you want to be able to call a friend and say hey dude listen i don't know what to do right like listen i, I don't know i don't even know how to go home and tell my wife that i i don't have the cash to do something but many people um then don't understand that and um you know you also need prayer buddies uh, and they run very few uh, on this journey um as well so it's been interesting from in terms of then firing them actually I think it's a case of, you know, no hard feelings, but just that we drifted so apart um, that I I don't spend that much time with you uh, at all. And I've seen some friends who run businesses that are doing illegal stuff. And for me, the association, I'm only 35. I still have another 65 years to go. And um, the only major asset I have right now is my name. Right, so I've had to now say no to those friends who who jeopardize, let's say, my relationship with my wife or my relationship with the market, um, where you just can't be associated to certain people, and that's how I've ended up like just having to uh, make the tough call of firing those friends. Yeah, oh, right. Hiring in your business. Oh, hiring them in the business. Yeah. Oh, I, I made that big mistake. And I, <laughs> um, so, so what I've done is that um, it's it's okay to hire even family and hire friends, but I've separated myself from it. Right. For example, I have an HR manager, 
and she is the one who actually works with the man because I only manage four people out of the whole company, right? And those are my only hires I need to be part of. Anyone else who comes in, let the manager make their decision, um, whether it's my friend or not. And I've had friends who've applied and they've been declining. They call call me saying, ah, I thought you were my friend, uh, etc. I wasn't hired, so you know I'm jobless. Um, yes, I want to help them find a job, but because of those systems, processes, and structures, especially in the confines of governance, let governance guide it. Um, because otherwise, we will never go far. Because the moment I've hired friends, it's ended badly. Um, it's really and it really ended badly. And I don't talk to some of them now um, because you know we had to fire each other and stuff like that. Yeah. Take one last question in the room because we need to start wrapping up now. We are over time. Oh, okay. No, thank you so much, uh, Victor. I think we might, we might end up having a Victor movie. Yeah? <laughs> you know, yeah, when you talk about the 2% and also you jumping onto the CEO's car, you know, that uh, shows uh, uh, serious levels of commitment and determination yeah. to achieve what you want. Yeah. And, and you touched quite a lot of things. I made a lot of uh, notes. Uh, so I don't want to go through everything that I list to you, but I've got a few areas that I know really affect many people, especially on the e ego side. You mentioned about the ego, let, letting go of the ego. I also just want to, you also to highlight on that issue, on how your ego, your personal ego affected you in this business and also how you managed to let go of it as well. And uh, on the second part of it, you mentioned about the power of family and also getting your wife involved. And um, I don't know how your wife, is, since you have been seeing each other in this uh, entrepreneurial, it was maybe easy for your wife to be involved. I don't know whether she's involved in the business right now or she's out. And how can you also help other people to get their wives truly involved and supporting them in the business who are not entrepreneurial? Because I think those are the, some of the small things that truly affect people deeply emotionally. Yeah, yeah. great questions. So I think on the ego side, um, I still have a long, a long, a lot of years to live, so I know it's gonna. The wisdom will keep uh, generating, but I think on the ego side, um, you see, if you're not, if you don't know your position in God, it leaves room for ego, um, because once you're in God, you know the humility is standard. Um, the humility of knowing that it's not my strength, but a lot of these things, there have been a lot of people who believed in me my journey so a lot of it's it's it's, it's not me uh, who's successful um i'm an enabler i'm build i'm a builder um so i'm building for the kingdom you know employing people bringing better life etc so the ego comes when we're not really tied into god number one and number two um uh, two weeks ago we had the health and we also spoke i think there was some mention of something similar, right? That us as men are naturally our bodies uh, tend to go more on the, on the ego side. And it's okay, that's how our bodies are built. However, um, I think you need to keep it internal. Uh, let's not let it manifest um, out, outside. When, why I say that is that the moment your ego starts uh, taking over, it affects everything. Your business, you start losing your partners, you start losing uh, you know, the, the quality of the family. Um, and I've learned that there are some things that I, you know, you can feel the ego coming, but it's about understanding myself and saying, I know this is ego. So I'm going to separate this. I'm going to separate this decision I'm about to make from ego. Um, and I'm going to keep a level head. Uh, and remove it away from that. So that's on the ego side, how they've been able to navigate it. Then on the family side, um, I don't know if my wife is on the call, but I, I, I struggle to work with my wife. So my wife is way smarter than I am. Like I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned these brightest young minds, etc. And she's also in the entrepreneurship space. So however, what I've, um, I think operationally, we would clash, right? Operationally, I think it would be a bit of a disaster. It would clash. 
What I've then have done is I've gotten involved strategically, right? So, for example, um, she's a shareholder of the company as well, right? Um, and nothing happens in the business, for example, without if I don't talk to her, right? I get her opinion or operational stuff. I don't get her involved because there she likes pink. I like my logo in blue, and then we don't want to be uh, fighting on that. So I've got her to get involved strategically, and I've been so fortunate to have her because uh, throughout this journey it's been tough, right? She has not been able to go buy what she needs to go buy and stuff like that and do what she really wants to do. I travel, she stays with kids and all those things. So that buy-in, uh, and she's bought into the vision. That buy-in is important because if she just doesn't buy into it, then I can't actually go and grow the business properly. And it's about having the foresight. Uh, so for example, we know we've got a number uh, she knows in four years, two months, I need to build a house. So, you know, and I'm, and I've got those cards to play with to say she knows what the end goal is in mind. And that way she's been able to be very supportive. And then I can come home to a hot meal, um, right? Not a takeaway meal or something. And it just makes a, the biggest of a difference from that perspective because she's supportive of what I'm doing. If she wasn't, she has not been supportive of, on earlier on, but um, I guess I work with a lot with us through it, um, but eventually, uh, you know, we completely in sync. And now I'm also starting to help her think about her own business uh, that she's busy uh, thinking about um, using my company, the company for her to take, you know, explore being the first customer and those type of things. Um, so yeah, I hope I've answered your question. Yeah. Great. I'm just going to read the comments from online. Um, Brother Blessing says, thank you, Victor. You've got a great story to tell, and I wish you all the best in your entrepreneurship journey. Um, then Farai Machapo says, please may you share a customer or employee story that helped you understand the impact of your business, and are there any books, podcasts, or a business platform that you could recommend? I just want to tie in that, that last comment with... Um, uh, I want to ask you, if you look back at your area now, um, is this something that you were just born with, uh, to, to be this productive, focused, seeking for opportunities, or, or this is something that you have developed over time? And if someone were to, so when you wake up in the morning or when you look uh, each month, what are some of those things that you've built in your life to make sure that you remain focused on the things that you, you want to do? And as you think of your three girls, right, what skills would you impart from what you have learned right now in your life? And then the second question would be, you know, we've seen quite a lot of companies uh, that are not growing as much as you do. Uh, we know the NASDAQ, you know, companies can be there and they don't have any profit. They just show this massive growth in turnover and whatever. So the question for us is to say, when are we going to see your company on the <laughs> on the Nasdaq? <laughs> it's, it's it's great question. So on on the resources, um, you know, I, I, I early on in my career, I you know, um, I had dreams. Uh, you know, like uh, sorry, I had uh, what do you call them? Um, people I looked up to, Bill Gates and Barack Obama, mm -hmm. and I've been fortunate I've met them in person. Um, and what's been amazing for me is that when I meet them, I just realize, well, why, why do I look up to them, right? To the point where the people I actually look up to, some of them are in this room, right? Uh, the mentors that people actually look up to, that you can actually call, so that's really helped me a lot, learning their journeys, um, understanding what they do, how they do it, um, and having learned uh, quite a bit on, 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 on their businesses. So for me, that's been a good source of uh, inspiration. Bill Gates can inspire me. I can never pick up the phone and call Bill Gates and tell him, listen, um, I, need, I need to fire this person. How do I do it? You'll never be able to answer and pick it. 
but I can talk to Sam, I can talk to Brother Simba, I can, you know, um, so my, my inspiration, actually I have access to it. So I had to do that mindset shift. Then in terms of the resources needed, uh, so I'll give you an example right now, I'm actually doing a course. Uh, my wife got me to do this course. Uh, it's a Power BI course because I want to, I just want to sit with data. I want to be able to go do strategic business development and not be worried about the operation. So I'm learning how to build my own dashboards with the data that I want and, you know, do my own visuals. So I think in terms of the resources, it's really about, there's too many of them, but it's really about in that season that you're in, what skill do you want to learn and what skill do you want to harness? Um, so like now I'm in the skill of expansion and for me to expand, I need to separate myself from operations. For me to separate my operations with my hands-on anxiety, I need some dashboards that I can go in and just see the health and I can call my COO and say, hey, I see um, this number is looking down, what's happening, etc." right? So in terms of the resources, I think it's really dependent on the season. And I'm, I'm happy uh, at a later stage, I should put together some resources, whether it's finance, all different aspects of the business. And then um, on your question around, uh, on your point around where to from here. So, you know, one of the key things that's happened is that I've been building a plane um, with the budget of a bicycle, right? which is the sad reality of African tech startups. Um, that we're not, we're under, very underfunded and undercapacitated. Um, and that's why we end up doing, you know, smaller things um, that don't really move the needle. So I've had to work extra hard, to get the team to work extra hard to, you know, with the little that we've got uh, to get the business to the point where we can, we can actually scale. And as a tech business, you're investing millions every month into the technology itself to build it uh, for uh, to become a product so in the next six to nine months we'll actually be uh, cash positive we'll actually be the first logistics platform um, in the whole of africa to achieve sort of profitability in less than five years all right and we are quite well ahead on the path to profit and the plan now is uh, to fatten the car afterwards Right, so build such an investable business that it's got the right governance, it's got the right metrics. Having been exposed to, you know, the stuff we're working on at BCP, how do you build a business that you can list? What are those key uh, measurables or metrics that will result in me in four years' time? Let's say if, um, we list the company for, you know, 20 billion rand 